There was a time when Germans and Israelis playing football together was far from a straightforward matter. A time when it would have been unthinkable for Israelis to cheer on German stars of the game. Every time uh, somebody asks me, how, how, do you, how can you cheer them, you know, after what happened in the Holocaust? And for Israel's under-21 team to have a German coach. Germany has a very high standing, at least in football. Or for Israelis to be playing in the Bundesliga. We cannot say for all our history, German hit us, Germany don't like us. Because it's really changed and, and now it's much more different. So how does it feel for a Jewish footballer today to represent Germany? I'm not naive. As a Jew in Germany, it's not all love, peace and harmony. And what has made football such a game changer when it comes to bringing Germans and Israelis closer together? My name is uh, Almo Cohen. Uh, I play for FC Ingolstadt. Uh, I'm 26 years old. I have my wife, Gal, and my daughter, Maylin. I'm happy to be here. I born in Be'er Sheva. My father born in Morocco, and my mother born in Israel. Their parents born in uh, Morocco. And I think Moroccan people, they are very warm. They are very friendly. And I remember just when I come to Nuremberg, to Germany, then uh, my father was living with me uh, one year, and after three, four months, he have more friends than I have. When I remember myself, when I start football at 12 years old in Israel, when I play in the garden, my dream is, was to play in Germany. In fact, I have two jobs. The first is under-21 coach, where I work with the team just like any other national team coach. And as technical director, there are more mid- and long-term tasks. In football, situations are resolved on the pitch with technical and tactical means, not with wars. And in football, you shoot with balls, not with missiles or with live ammunition. My name is Alec Privalov. I'm 27 and I've been playing for Tus Maccabi for six years. Tus Maccabi is a Jewish club and we incorporate the traditions and holidays. I've been in Germany for over 20 years. I'm originally from the Soviet Union. We came here when I was three. Football and sport in general played a major role. Football teaches you discipline. The coach showed us by example. And the German kids were always punctual, disciplined and ambitious. I tried to copy all of that, so football has also helped me to learn more about Germany. My name is Zvika Riz. I'm 37 years old from Tel Aviv, Israel, and I support the German national team and Bayern Munich. I started uh, following the German national team since 1990 when they uh, won the World Cup. And since then, it's uh, like a romantic story. We 
usually when it comes to Bayern Munich and Germany football matches, the Israeli media is not writing a lot about them. Uh, they're not really fond when it comes to German football. See, only a few words. Only a few words about Bayern. That's it. But when it comes to Messi, they talk many, many, many about Messi, Ronaldo, Messi, Ronaldo, Messi, Ronaldo. I have a headache from Messi and Ronaldo. That's why I was happy in the World Cup. They shut up their mouth for both, also Messi and Ronaldo. Ronaldo 4-0, Messi, the World Cup. That's the best answer. Okay, guys, we're fit and prepared, and we're going to rock for 90 minutes. We're going to win challenges, we're going to be available for passes, and we're not going to hide. We know what we want, and we know where we want to go. We want to do it and get points here. That's why we came here. First, a hard graph for 45 minutes. Now, come on, let's do it. A Sunday just like any other in Berlin. Maccabi Berlin are playing away at BFC Preussen in a top-of-the-table local league clash. It's first against fourth with Alec Privalov in midfield for Maccabi. Maccabi Berlin was originally a 100% Jewish club, but its makeup has changed since its resurrection in 1970, with Jews playing alongside non-Jews. For me, it's important that it's been possible to get established as a Jew or a Jewish club in Berlin and see that Tuz Maccabi is a very modern and multicultural club. We have people from all backgrounds and religions playing here. On the pitch, we're a team and friends. The game isn't going Maccabi's way, although they do pull a goal back. But just before finish, Preussen wrap up the game 3-1. Maccabi honors Jewish traditions and the team celebrate Jewish holidays together. And together they've also had to suffer hostility towards the club. There was one away game probably three years ago now. There were a lot of people around the pitch shouting out things that have no place in a normal football game. They were totally out of order. They shouted things like, damn Jew. And they cursed Turkish players too, saying, you play in a Jewish club? Shame on you, traitor. And stuff like that. I can't focus on that because otherwise I'd stop playing football and would instead just get annoyed. Getting worked up about the ref, yourself and whatever is bad enough. And if I then started analyzing the language some people use against me, it would do my head in. Alec was in the thick of the action in Tel Aviv at the 2013 Maccabiya Games, a competition often called the Jewish Olympics. Jewish athletes from 70 nations took part. Alec Privalov captained the football team representing Germany. Being in the German national side, this is a big honor in Israel. You could see from the sheer scale what a big event it is. The whole of Israel was watching. This delegation had 202 athletes. Good luck to you all. And summer 2015 will see the European Maccabi Games, pitting the best Jewish sportsmen and women from across the continent against each other in Berlin. We're very confident going into this tournament. We're proud to be representing Germany and just as proud to be Jewish. We now have a big community in Germany, a Jewish collective. 
So why shouldn't we represent Germany as it's now become? We're advancing and becoming more modern. It's important for me to be visibly present, but also for German Jews to show we live in Germany and we're happy to be playing for Germany. Spika Riz is among the thousands of football fans in Israel. Most, of course, support their own country, and many follow the big-name clubs from England and Spain. But Spika roots for Germany and Bayern Munich. When we were watching the World Cup 1990. I was watching it with my father, and I asked him who plays against who, and he told me, you see the German team, they will take the World Cup. So I followed the team. And I saw they win again and win again. And then came the final against Argentina. And I said, oh, playing against Maradona? That's good. We are the underdog. And I like cheering for the underdog. And uh, after the whist final whistle, I was happy for the first time, you know, cheering for a, for a team football that takes a big trophy, famous trophy. And I said, okay, I picked myself a good team. He's gearing up for a big night. A few hours from now, it's because beloved FC Bayern will be playing in the quarterfinals of the Champions League against Porto. Zvika works as a computer administrator in Tel Aviv, but his real passion is the Facebook page he runs for Israeli fans of German football. My dream is that one day the DFB will give me a call and say, listen, we want you to be our ambassador in Israel and you can be as an employee, we'll, we will employ you. You know, we'll give you money so you can do this stuff, not just on your free time, you can get paid. And this way I will be very, very happy. Zvika spent two weeks last summer supporting the German team at the World Cup in Brazil. He then watched the final with his friends back in Israel on a beach in Tel Aviv. Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> I was holding the, the, uh, the video like this, and I was jumping with them. There were, of course, also tourists that came here and German people that came there. But the people that make the noise, they're Israelis. <laughs> the people who are surrounding or not making the noise, they're Germans. <laughs> This is a friend of mine. He's really mad about Germany. He has a tattoo. Look. So now I'm like interviewing him. Like, how can you be a German fan in this way? I feel it's part of my life, you know, to be a pioneer here in Israel when it comes to German football, to not be ashamed that I like German football, to be proud that I like German football. You don't get choose where you get born. And in the same way, I could, you could have been born in Germany and you don't, and you can't take the fault of what your grandfather or your grand-grandfather did. And, and at the end, it's sport, it's football. And that's where it's supposed to be. Israel is currently involved in the qualification round for the 2016 European Championships. Michael Neis is also involved as technical director of the Israeli Football Association. Every success that the national side has on the pitch obviously boosts the identity factor. People who love football quickly identify with the team if they're playing well and also getting good results. 
als Mannschaft auftritt und äh, dann noch erfolgreich ist. Und die fragen dann auch gar nicht nach. They don't care about where a player comes from or what their religious affiliation is. Israel hasn't qualified for a major tournament since the 1970 World Cup. The country was originally a member of the Asian Football Confederation. After being expelled in 1984 due to political opposition from Arab nations, Israel joined the European Federation. Now they're hoping to make it to the finals in France in summer 2016. Michael, for us, is a very professional. He's giving us the professional side of football. Very experienced guy. Uh, brings uh, the approach that uh, we all looked for. Michel Nez plans to rebuild Israeli football from the ground up. We only have to form one national side, not three or four. Germany could probably field four or five teams on a similar level. The young elite being developed in Germany is as big as all the players here that age. Second Division club Ingolstadt is playing a friendly. Last season, Cohen was a regular, but then in July, he suffered a fractured tibia. This is his first appearance in the starting lineup since then. Ingolstadt looks set to win a promotion to the First Division for the first time in the club's history. When we go first league, yes, then it's, you know, it's every time great feeling to play against the best player in the world. Like Gotze, Reus, Muller, German football, they are so strong and they are so good. And I think uh, now everyone knows it's German, German Bundesliga is one of the top leagues in the world. So tired. Yeah, really, very tired. Yeah. After a long time, play 90 minutes is not too easy. Yeah. Arbar Cohen is the fifth Israeli to have played in the Bundesliga. He's now also in the Israeli national side with 12 caps to date. His big breakthrough came in 2010 when he signed to Nuremberg. It was a big move in more ways than one for the then 21-year-old. When I was in Nuremberg, much more I spoke about political things, but normally I don't go inside for I don't go really inside for politics thing because I'm not a political man. You know, I'm a football player and I come to, to make my things sport and to show my quality. But this kind of team, like things like racism, for me is like red light, you know? You cannot pass this red light. And my father and mother, I think they, they lend me like to give respect for every people. Doesn't matter which color, which religion. And, you know, when I come, I can have I have Muslim friend, I have Christian friend, and they can be like my brother. Cohen's best friends at the club were Mehmet Ekici and Ilke Gundayan, who went on to become a Dortmund and Germany star. Both are Muslims. They'd often come round for dinner to sample Cohen's dad's Israeli cooking. The club's training ground is next to the infamous Nazi party rally grounds where the Nuremberg racial purity laws were proclaimed that deprived German Jews of their rights. Our oh, training plus is there and the stadium is here. I see this every time, but really to come inside like this, it's my first time, never, never I don't come inside. It's make me some bad feeling when I'm here. It was right from this spot that Hitler delivered his tirades against Jews to a party faithful crowd of tens of thousands. I remember my father come and he was also very, very sad. And when he come here and watch this, all this big, all the building, is now understanding because I have this feeling now also. I know what happened here and I know, and I know uh, the history and a lot of Jewish die and I'm, I'm Jewish and maybe if I was in this time, maybe also I was, I was die. 
Yeah, maybe they still keep yeah. these things. Like the people coming and to know to know what happened yes. It's, it's very important I see I see now also the rabbi from our community. The rabbi helped Ahmed Cohen settle in in Nuremberg. And that wasn't easy at first. Aymok had many questions. What was the coach really saying in the changing room? And where could he get kosher food in Germany? Someone told me there was a footballer coming to Nuremberg. I think it was his father who first contacted me, and we met for the first time at the synagogue. Normally on Champions League evenings, Zwicka meets up with friends in a pub, but today is different. Because it's Holocaust Memorial Day, tomorrow the pub is closed, and there's no sport on TV. Uh, because of Holocaust evening, we won't be uh, giving information, uh, updates from the match tonight. Tomorrow, we will upload only uh, posts that are relevant to the Holocaust. For Bayern's previous big game, he and his friends were invited to the studio by Israel's biggest sports station. They were showing in Sport 5 this uh, small report about Kurt Landauer. And they asked me, uh, did you know about the Jewish roots of Bayern Munich? That Jewish background was largely unknown even to many Bayern Munich players until just a few years ago. Kurt Lander was a very important person in the history of Bayern Munich. He was a person pro-tolerance against violence and against racism, and that is something that is still alive today. I think that post got, a, I think, the most likes ever in my page, because it's much more easier to people to connect uh, to football uh, here in Israel through Judaism. The Israeli Bayern fans usually make lots of noise when their team is playing, but tonight there's not all that much to cheer about. It's just not Bayern's night. At halftime, Yaron reveals what made him a Germany fan. I've always loved the captain of the Germany team, whether it was Klinsmann or Mateus or Balak. I thought having a tattoo with Germany's World Cup stars would be really nice, so I did. But there was the dilemma of whether I should have the team's logo done on my back or on my arm like a captain's armband with the stars representing the World Cup titles. Hopefully I'll have another three or four stars on this arm by the time I die. You see it as your national flag. We see it, he sees it as his favorite football team. It's, it's different.
On Holocaust Memorial Day, life comes to a complete halt in Israel for two minutes. We are at a memorial site to the victims of the Theresienstadt ghetto. As I was in this ceremony, I was getting these photos <clears throat> from uh, my family. We have this kind of uh, WhatsApp group for family, and they send me photos of the grand-grandfathers and grand-grandmother that were murdered in the Holocaust in Auschwitz. So it makes you feel a little bit even more connected to what happened 70 years ago. Um, I'm named after my grandfather, who, was, who lost most of his family in the Holocaust. And he himself fought the Nazis as a partisan soldier. What many people don't know is that during the Second World War, there was a football league in Theresienstadt. You see the name of the team. This is coming from Yad Vashem. You can see the Electriker and Fleischer and uh, Agibor Prague. The names are coming from the walking places or teams that they liked, like Fortuna Kern. Oded Breda organized an exhibition about the league in Theresienstadt after recognizing his uncle in an old photo. This is the professional goal. We started to research the origins of the um, of the family, and because I'm a football fan, so I, I thought until then that the, the game that was shot in the propaganda movie was a kind of one game for propaganda. The greatest sport Veranstaltung in Theresienstadt zum Fußballwettspiel. Um die Zuschauermenge fassen zu können, findet das Wettspiel immer auf dem Hof einer früheren Kaserne statt. Wegen des etwas beschränkten Spielraumes sind die beiden Mannschaften nur je sieben Mann stark. Trotzdem wird von Anfang bis zum Ende den begeistert mitgehenden Zuschauern ein hartes Spiel geliefert. I started to be curious about the fact that how come in a ghetto there is a league. I never heard about something like this before, that people play football in a ghetto. The problem with Liga Theresien, you don't see Holocaust here. You don't see SS, you don't see fans, you don't see uh, misery. You see something like, okay, some people, the Jews play football, enjoy their life. And then the only hint for the Holocaust is the Judenstern here. Okay, that you can see somehow. Okay, you can see here, yeah. which is not that clear. And that's it. People are dressed well. They were ordered to be to come dressed well. They ended the shooting around mid-September. At the end of September, all the transports from Theresien to uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau started. So, in less than a month, all the people that you saw here were on the way to Auschwitz. The Olympic Park in Berlin, built by the Nazis for the Summer Games of 1936. Jews were banned from the German team. In the summer of 2015, those same grounds will host the first ever European Maccabi Games to be held in Germany. Does it give me the chills? I grew up in this city, and I know the Olympic Stadium primarily because of Hertha Berlin, and I now associate Hertha with a multicultural club. The football final will take place at the small stadium where the reserve team of first division side Hertha normally play. Perhaps that final will feature the Germany side captained by Alek Privarov. I can see the teams coming down here, lining up before the game. The referee blows his whistle and the game kicks off. And it's us playing against our opponents. The final in Berlin, that adds an extra touch to the whole thing. It makes me proud too, being able to stand here with 10 of my friends. I'm already picturing the final again. But even apart from being able to play here, we're all able to follow our hobby and our passion. 
We have friends and family watching, here at this place, wearing that shirt as a German Jew. It's really emotional. Right now I'm imagining getting a penalty in the final and converting it. It's a little like a movie running through my head. When you look at that goal, it's just begging you to score a goal. The netting is perfect. A sports ground in a suburb of Jerusalem. The Peres Center for Peace runs a project here supported by Michael Nais, coaching Palestinian and Israeli youngsters. Instruction is in both Hebrew and Arabic. I was told here are some very, very good players. <laughs> So I didn't hesitate a single second to come to see if we find some players for our national teams. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here and uh, I think we should just have some fun. Today there are practice sessions for the Palestinian kids, tomorrow for their Israeli counterparts. At the weekend they'll be playing together in mixed teams instead of opposing each other. The idea is to break down barriers. It's unacceptable. Just you can see them walking next to each other in the shopping mall. They can meet each other and never say hello because they may be afraid of one of each other because they never can meet. And on the field with just football, you can make them to, to do a little peace process. Nais has experience in that field. He previously worked with groups in inter-ethnic conflicts in South Africa and Rwanda and knows what football is capable of. We are the only one just meet the kids. All the other ones say, okay, now if Israel playing against Palestine or Jewish Would be really interesting if you would train? Train them together. There, mixed. And here, mixed. Then it would be... Then it will be... Then it's going to be peace. Peace often seems a distant prospect in a place divided by conflict a place all too used to terrorist attacks and military incursions. Not the easiest of environments for a coach from abroad. I remember the Gaza war back then. It began during the under-21 European Championships in Hungary. The players and the coach were glued to their TV screens and the internet. And that's where you lose concentration, although it's understandable, of course. These guys are under 21s, they're all soldiers, and their colleagues are being deployed in combat zones. And because they play for the national team, they get privileged treatment, but their concentration did suffer. We're off to Arad, not far from the Dead Sea, to meet Shmuel Rosenthal. In the 70s, uh, that was the only time that Israel qualified for the World Cup in uh, Mexico 1970. I think Rosenthal was the first Israeli players who played abroad, not just Germany. Uh, and of course, he was the first pioneer of the Bundesliga. For me, it's just history. But it is interesting, yeah, meeting somebody from the history who has a really big influence. I believe for Rosenthal it was even more difficult than nowadays because back in the 70s, the Holocaust memory was still fresh. Tzvika knows Shmuel Rosenthal's story. His father came to Israel from Lithuania in 1935, aged 17. His entire family were later murdered in the Holocaust. Rosenthal Sr. established a career as a footballer in Israel. 
His son followed suit and ended up in, of all places, Germany. In the summer of 1972, Shmuel Rosenthal signed to Borussia Mönchengladbach, a career highlight with big expectations for the player. From each country, you know, they say they like choose one. Beckenbauer from Germany, uh, Van Himsten, you know, from Belgium, Pelé, Bobby Charlton, Shmuel Rosenthal, Riva, you know, Rivera. Yeah. Rosenthal was known in Europe after appearing at the 1970 World Cup for Israel. Then came the deadly terrorist attack on the Israeli team at the Munich Olympics in 1972. I was very famous. Mm. Uh, and uh, the terrorist uh, was you still there. That, uh, you were afraid that it would be attacked. That happened also again. Mm. So the, the embassy gave me uh, some guy who protect me. Bodyguard. Bodyguard like this. So I play in uh, the Olympic Stadium in with München. München Gladbach. In München. In München, okay. Mm -hmm. In München, in Munich. And it was snow. I never yeah, used, I, I never used to, to snow. This you punk is, no? This my, this is me. Mm. <laughs> this is this is uh, he, he ran for me. <laughs> you know, I tried to watch him. You know, I have to to keep eye on him. You couldn't keep and up with was, the space. He was very fast, and he was. It was very difficult for me. The snow and also his speed. Rosenthal had already played against München Gladbach two years before signing to the club. He appeared for Israel in a historic friendly. In May 1970, München Gladbach became the first professional side from Germany to play in the country. Security was tight due to fears of a hostile reaction, but the capacity home crowd applauded the visitors, despite Gladbach winning 6-0. Two years later, Schmuel Rosenthal signed to Gladbach. His transfer to Germany was another visible sign of football having the power to help reconcile Germany and Israel. I was born because of football. Mm -hmm. My father he came to Israel in, in 1935 mm. in the Maccabiya, second Maccabiya. Okay. And then after a year, the war, the war start, the war, and all the family of my father killed in the, in the, by the Nazis, all the Holocaust. In the Holocaust. So I uh, tell to my father that uh, I'm going to play in Germany. How do you feel about it? You know, he talked about, to look in my eyes and said, uh, it, it's not so easy for me to say to you, but if you are talking about a, a professional, talking about a achievement in sport, you become a first Israeli player who play overseas in Germany, in one of the best team, I give you my blessing. Before I come to Germany, they say like the German people, they're a little bit cold and they are quiet and they don't talk, they don't let you feel like it's your family. But I have best friend and I meet all the family for, 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 for our players and they are, they are very warm. And then when I go to Israel back, I say like it's, it's much more different like what they think about the German, like they are really are. I can speak German. You hear it spoken a lot on the streets. I don't have to pretend anything or put on a mask. I can be who I am, totally normal, and as a German. People accept me without any prejudices, and that's what has impressed me the most. Man 
trifft auch häufig auf Menschen. You often meet people, whether they're Germans or of Turkish or Arab descent, who say, hey, you're a Jew playing for Tus Maccabi. I don't agree with Israeli policies, but I accept you as a human being. And I appreciate that. Das kann ich nachvollziehen, also da habe ich auch Verständnis. What's unique about football is it's showing you that there is a way of living together even though you have different background. And, uh, and that's what we should try to reach. That's the main goal, to be together doesn't matter where you came from, where you grew up, what's your what your parents, what your grandfather, what matters is you today and the future. Good night Berlin, we love the German and we want the peace in all the world. Good night. I love Germany.